So the big question now, how do we get our product out of the ground and transform it into the natural gas that is used in homes and industry? Well, the process of extracting natural gas and moving it to where it can be used is a complicated one. A lot happens behind the scenes to make delivery of natural gas to homes possible. Let's start with exploration and production. Exploration is the process of locating accumulations of oil and natural gas trapped under the Earth's surface. Production is the process of recovering those hidden resources for processing, delivery to markets, and use. Exploration and production both require large sums of money. A viable EMP company must have significant levels of capital investment available. They'll first have to identify the investment opportunities, analyze the economics, and finally acquire rights to invest before they can drill. Now, there isn't any way to be absolutely sure where new natural gas reserves are located, so geologists and engineers need to collect clues as to what lies deep beneath the Earth's surface. Advanced technology has revolutionized the exploration process for natural gas and helped them pinpoint potential reserves with greatly improved accuracy. This results in fewer unsuccessful wells and lowered exploration costs. Engineers use airplanes and satellites to map the surface to identify promising geological formations and to look for oil and natural gas seeps, all in the quest for above ground clues to what lies below the surface. Ships serve the same purpose in ocean floor exploration, but engineers often get much more useful information by looking at geological structures and rock properties below the surface. Now to this end, they use a number of tools, including seismic surveys, exploration wells, and gravity and geomagnetic surveys. After exploratory wells have been drilled and the resulting data has been gathered and analyzed, it's time to make the most challenging decision in the entire energy production process, whether or not the underground formation is promising enough to justify the enormous expense of proceeding with production. Geologists and engineers must consider, number one, the amount of natural gas that can be produced and how to deliver it to consumers. Number two, the technology required to bring the natural gas to the surface. And number three, the cost of getting it out of the ground and the time required to start production. The objective, of course, is to deliver as much natural gas as possible to consumers. Now, assuming these considerations are favorable, the production process begins with the drilling of a well. The geographic locations of these drilling sites often present a whole new set of challenges. The sites can range from ice-bound Arctic climates to regions 20,000 feet below sea level. In response, natural gas companies deploy a combination of time-tested techniques along with innovative technologies. Together, they enable producers to tap into resources that were formerly thought to be inaccessible. Drilling a well is a complex process, often involving as many as 30 different service companies, each one adhering to stringent around-the-clock scheduling, safety, and environmental practices. Understanding how a well is drilled better enables us to see why producing natural gas takes so much time and money. For one thing, there are many different types of drilling rigs. Which type is used depends upon the specific requirements of each drill site. Some examples of rig types include land-based, slim hull, coil tubing, and jack-up drill rigs, now as well as semi-submersible rigs and drill ships. The land-based rotary drilling rig is the most common type used for exploration and production. Let's look at the process for completing and extracting natural gas from a land-based rig. The first task is to prepare the location. Roads might have to be built, containment pits dug to comply with environmental requirements, and space cleared for the drilling equipment. Then, infrastructure for water and electricity must be provided. To prevent contamination, an earthen pit is dug and lined with a thick layer of plastic to hold rock cuttings and drilling mud. Next, a pilot hole is dug at the precise location marked by the survey crew for the main hole. Additional holes called a mouse hole and a rat hole are dug nearby to hold pieces of equipment during the drilling process. Then it's time to bring in the rig equipment and rig up. A rig that can dig a 10,000 foot well requires 50 to 75 people and 35 to 45 semi trucks to bring in and assemble the rig, normally requiring about three and a half days. The rig is then inspected to make sure it meets all the specifications and safety standards. Rig operations continue 24-7, 364 days per year. Only on Christmas Day is the drill site quiet. Two shifts per day of complete crews are assigned to the project. Drilling happens in stages, drilling, running, and cementing new casing, and then drilling again until the bit reaches the targeted depth. A typical rotary rig consists of a power source and a derrick for raising and lowering the drill bit. 
The bit is attached to a length of steel piping called the drill string. As the bit grinds down through the earth and rock, drilling mud is pumped down the resulting borehole to lubricate the bit. The mud is then pumped back to the surface to bring up rock cuttings. In the past, well holes were always drilled straight down, limiting the expiration to a vertical boundary. Two fairly recent developments in drilling technology have increased the area from which a well can draw. Horizontal drilling can bend the hole as it's drilled and allow the tubing to reach a reservoir at a horizontal angle. Now this makes it possible to reach gas deposits that, for whatever reason, cannot be drilled from above. Another method called directional drilling makes it possible to drill in a number of different directions from a single wellhead. Now, after the well is drilled, there's still much to be done before it's ready to produce and meet environmental requirements. All results are analyzed, contents checked, quality and quantity. Now, once the well is determined a producer, it's time to complete the well and prepare it for production. First, a pipe called the casing is lowered down the drilled hole. Now, there may be multiple strings of casing, one inside the other, which are cemented into place. Casing will also seal off the hole and, among other things, protect any underground water supplies and keep the hole from caving in. Tubing is then lowered into the casing. The natural gas will flow up through the tubing after it's perforated. Now, because the casing is solid, holes must be punched into it to allow the oil or gas to flow in while allowing fracturing fluids to flow out into the surrounding rock formations. A perforating gun is positioned and fired at a specific angle. Now, this is actually a shaped explosive charge that creates a perforation tunnel through the steel casing, the cement sheath, and right into the surrounding reservoir of rock. Gas and fluids then flow into the well bore and up to the surface. Sometimes fluids are injected into the well hole to stimulate or fracture the soil and encourage the release of trapped oil or gas. In other words, fracturing is the breaking up of the surrounding rock through fluid pressure. As seams are created in the formation, the fluid leaves deposits of sand-like material. This material leaves a porous path for the oil or gas to flow toward the casing. Fracking is like a mini earthquake. In order to frack, you need a mix of over 596 chemicals. False. The fracturing process uses a mixture of fluids comprised almost entirely 99.5% of water and sand. The remaining materials used to help deliver the water down the well bore are typically found and used around the house. The average fracturing operation utilizes fewer than 12 of these components, according to the Groundwater Protection Council, not 596. Fracturing has not only been used to increase the flow of oil and natural gas from existing wells, but also to access things like water and geothermal energy. Some wells are outfitted with a system of valve at the top, affectionately called a Christmas tree due to its appearance. It regulates the flow from the well into surface facilities or into pipelines that take oil and natural gas to remote facilities for processing and sale. Extracting oil and natural gas from deposits deep underground isn't as simple as just drilling and completing a well. Any number of factors in the underground environment can impede the free flow of gas into the well. In the past, it was common to recover as little as 10% of the available oil in a reservoir, leaving the rest underground. Today, advanced technology allows production of about 60% of the available resources from a formation. Offshore drilling is a very different kind of challenge. It requires specialized mobile offshore drilling units that have been designed to work in various depths of water. Jackup rigs are used in fairly shallow water. They sit on steel legs that rest on the sea floor. Floating drilling vessels, semi-submersibles, and drill ships must be used in deeper water. These vessels can drill in 10,000 feet of water and 30,000 feet below the sea floor. The semi-submersible rigs are towed to sea, positioned over the drill site, and attached to the ocean bottom using traditional mooring and anchoring systems. Typically, millions of cubic feet of oil and natural gas are pumped out these various rigs each day. Transporting enough oil and natural gas across the globe to meet the daily demand is an epic undertaking. And at each step, technology has been developed to meet the challenge. The processed natural gas we use to cook our food and heat our homes is 90% clean burning methane, the simplest form of hydrocarbon. But that's not the case for natural gas as it comes from the ground. 
Depending on the location of the well and the geologic conditions that created the gas in the first place, contaminants such as water, sulfur, and natural gas liquids may be present. As a result, gathering pipelines must collect the raw natural gas from wells in a given region and deliver it to local processing plants. Natural gas is toxic. False. Natural gas is non-toxic and cannot cause you to become sick unless the gas is in such high concentrations that you cannot get enough oxygen to breathe. To make wellhead gas ready for the marketplace requires separation and dehydration, treating, processing, and fractionation. Now, each step takes into account the physical properties of the materials involved, specific gravity, boiling points, liquefaction points, and chemical composition. Only then can the processed gas enter the pipeline distribution system. Transmission pipelines use large diameter pipes to transport gas for long distances from supply basins to the end-user marketplaces. Natural gas pipeline networks are generally broken into three distinct systems. Number one, gathering systems carry natural gas from individual wells for bulk processing at a treatment facility. Number two, transmission systems carry the processed natural gas, often over long distances, from the producing region to local distribution systems around the country. And number three, local distribution systems deliver natural gas into our homes, businesses, and power plants. Compressor stations move gas through interstate pipelines to utilities or other direct purchase customers, maintaining gas pressure and flow. Since natural gas is used primarily for home heating and cooling, there are times during the year where physical supply is insufficient to meet demand. That problem is solved by storing gas in off-peak seasons for later delivery when demand is high. Gas may also be super chilled until it converts to a liquid called LNG for liquefied natural gas. This makes it possible to store and transport much larger quantities, but it's also very expensive. Now, just what is liquefied natural gas? LNG is natural gas that has been cooled to about minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit for shipment and or storage as a liquid. The volume of the liquid is about 600 times smaller than in its gaseous form. Now, in this compact form, natural gas can be shipped in several tankers to receiving terminals in the United States and other importing countries. At these terminals, the LNG is returned to a gaseous form and transported by pipeline to distribution companies, industrial consumers, and power plants. A distribution system, such as a local utility, connects to the interstate pipeline at a city gate. Distribution companies use flow labs, such as this one right here, to train their employees on how to properly maintain systems. Natural gas stinks. False. Natural gas has no odor. As a safety precaution, the city gate also adds a distinctive odorant called mercaptan, so that if natural gas escapes, it can be detected. Local distribution companies, or LDCs, do not make money selling gas. They're allowed to charge only what they pay for gas with no markup. Their profit comes from transportation services. They're allowed to charge a rate that covers their costs plus a regulated percentage for profit. With this delivery, the journey of natural gas from the producers to the consumers is complete. The end user is the ultimate customer. Theirs is the most important sector of the industry because they pay everyone's salaries. If there were no market, there would be no reason to drill wells, no need for building pipelines, no need to employ accountants to process bills. The way local distribution companies operate varies from state to state. In some states, the LDC market sells and delivers gas to customers. In others, customers have choice programs that allow them to choose the marketer who they will buy their gas from. For example, Georgia's market is totally unbundled. Residential customers usually buy from an LDC, sometimes from a gas marketing company, and in rare cases, directly from a producer. The marketing and trading companies buy and sell gas. Today, there are two distinct natural gas markets, the physical and the financial. The physical market involves the buying and selling of the actual product, natural gas. Here, physical gas is exchanged for money. In the contrast, the financial market treats natural gas as a commodity in which futures and derivative contracts are traded on financial exchanges such as the New York Mercantile Exchange. Drilling companies keep the names of chemicals used at drilling sites a secret. False. 
Drilling companies must disclose the names of all chemicals to be stored and used at a drilling site as part of the permit application process. These plans contain copies of the material safety data sheets for all chemicals. This information is on file with the Department of Environmental Protection and is available to landowners, local governments, and emergency responders. Natural gas today is for many a necessity. It plays such a large role in our lives and in our economy that certain aspects of the natural gas industry are regulated by the government. There are very strict government regulations and industry standards in place to ensure the safe transportation, storing, distribution, and use of natural gas. In the current regulatory environment, only pipelines and local distribution companies are directly regulated. Natural gas producers and marketers are not directly regulated. This is not to say that there are no rules governing their conduct, but instead there's no government agency specifically charged with the direct oversight of their day-to-day -day business. Production and marketing companies must still operate within the confines of the law. For instance, producers are required to obtain the proper authorization and permitting before beginning to drill particularly on federally owned land. However, the prices they charge are a function of competitive markets and are no longer regulated by the government. Interstate pipeline companies, on the other hand, are fully regulated in the rates they charge, the access they offer to their pipelines, and the construction of new pipelines. Similarly, local distribution companies are regulated by state utility commissions, which oversee their rates, construction issues, and ensure proper procedures exist for maintaining adequate supply to their customers. These regulating bodies include the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, the Public Utility Commissions, the Mineral Management Service, the Department of Transportation, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the North America Energy Standards Board. The natural gas industry also has several trade organizations that help companies, including the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America, the American Gas Association, the Natural Gas Supply Association, and the Southern Gas Association. 